The Madara Adventure Mode demands a committed group of players willing to get immersed in our story, tough decisions, and of course, our incredibly diverse set of options for character customization. When beginning the story mode, you must first select a story your group would like to start. Of course, Madara Unintentional Malum Act 1 only has one story included. However, in the future, we intend to release not only more parts to Unintentional Malum Act 1, uh, but we also plan on releasing solo stories, two-player stories, as well as more epic four-player stories. Once you've selected a story, in this example, Unintentional Malum Act 1, Open the corresponding adventure book to its first inside page and read the introduction text. The introduction text details all of the rules for using the book, as well as the special rules associated with this particular story. Let's go over some of the specifics. The adventure book is not intended to be read outside of playing the game. Players should never read any scene or page that they aren't explicitly told to read. The adventure book will contain lots of hidden information, hidden behind red boxes that look like this. Using this sweet red revealer we've included in the game, players can reveal the hidden text behind these boxes. In Madara, we hide tons of information behind these boxes. Everything from quest rewards, to what you find in treasure chests, or even what spawns and how it spawns. We'll even hide entire blocks of narrative if we need to. It should go without saying, but don't read these unless you're told to. The adventure book also explains how to save or pause your game. Simply put, we've included Ziploc bags that each player can use to stuff everything currently used by their adventurer at the end of a session. This means that when you return to set up the game at a later date, each player simply dumps everything out inside of their corresponding bag and sets everything up in front of them, and then they're good to go. The adventure book is separated by various types of sections that we've color-coded for easy browsing. The sections are as followed. Introduction, story scenes, ending scenes, encounters, side quests, and story rounds. Introduction text goes over what we're discussing right now. Story scenes are sections of text that must be read aloud or listened to using our nifty Madara companion app. Ending scenes and side quests are special types of story scenes that are read aloud and follow all the same rules as a normal story scene. However, they denote special characteristics about the scene. In the case of a side quest, players can use the orange bar to remind themselves that they are currently participating in some part of the narrative that is optional, slaying boars or something like that while ending scenes denote a scene that will end the game, like a game over in a video game. If you reach one of these scenes, your story has come to an end in either triumphant glory or horrific agony. Lastly, you have encounters. Encounters denote the special sections of the adventure book where players will set up the game board and slay some monsters. Next, players must read the special rules associated with their chosen story. In Unintentional Malum Act 1, the only special rules associated with it are the starting adventure players must use. Players are instructed to choose an adventurer they'd like to play. They get to choose between our fiery and brave Princess Nightingale Arson, her friend and fellow socialite in high society, the laid-back Zeke Zhang, the stoic, smart, and clever Rook Lars, or the seemingly shy girl with a seedy past, Remy Moretti. After choosing your character, Unintentional Malum Act 1 instructs players to continue to the first story scene before the mast on page 4. Now you'll notice that it didn't tell you to take any other components besides adventurers. That's done on purpose. So, in this particular story, players will simply choose the adventure they're going to play and continue to before the mast on page four. So, since you were instructed to go to page four, you do. You flip to the, the book to page four, admiring the sweet artwork on the way. And then read the scene aloud from the top or simply start the audio from the corresponding scene in our companion app. 
you'll notice that the size of our narrative is huge when compared to other games. We really, really meant it when we said that it had a novel's worth of narrative. However, we get that not everyone likes to read books or sit through long bouts of narrative. For those of you who don't want to read all of the text aloud and also don't even want to sit through the narrative via an audiobook, but yet still yearn for the crunchiness of our campaign, we got you covered. We've also got a greatly abridged version of our narrative available for download on our website. That way, you can read a paragraph or three, look at cool artwork, and get to smashing some baddies in record time, and still have enough context to make some of our narrative decisions that will mechanically affect you as you progress throughout the game. Alrighty, so, as you're reading through the first scene, you'll notice that the text comes to an abrupt halt at the bottom of the page. However, there is this bolded word continue listed. This means that the text continues to the next page. You'll even notice that the header of the next scene has the same name, only it says continued next to its title. This is another way to keep track of where you're at while reading. So, you continue reading to the next page. However, once again, the dastardly text comes to an abrupt halt, this time just above a tan box. We call these tan boxes adventure mechanics. Anytime an adventure mechanic appears, players stop reading the scene and follow any instructions they are given via the adventure mechanic. In this case, players are choosing gear for their magical aptitude and skill test. The adventure mechanic tells the players to select a pre-made kit, but don't worry, you'll have a chance to build your own kit after the mast. The kits are a way for players to get started as soon as possible, and hopefully give you a feel for a certain type of build. That way, by the time you get a bit further in the story, you'll be able to choose new disciplines and items with some idea of what you like and what you don't like. Players then continue reading or listening to the scene. After flipping to the next page, players will find themselves confronted with something new. Nyx is at the bottom, and alongside her faithful companion Toast, she's trying to be helpful via a parchment colored box we call tips. While not required, these tips are probably a good idea to read. It's not like we were down in the trenches of game design being whipped to reach some kind of Skyrim-esque tip quota. We actually only did the work when we felt it was something that might be of value. Anyway, so, beyond the tip, the text comes to an end on an adventure mechanic that tells players to continue to the mast day one on page seven. This will bring us to our first encounter. Encounters are spread throughout the adventure book and are organically placed on pages as you progress through the narrative. Encounters represent all the moments in our story where the characters are fighting monsters, exploring caves, or doing some other sort of high fantasy style questing. Since reading encounters is the same, whether you're playing the crawl mode or the adventure mode, we'll go over encounters in greater detail in a later video. Instead, for now, we're going to focus on how encounters interact with the rest of the adventure mode. Encounters can be won or lost. Depending on whether you win or lose, the encounter's end conditions will detail what rewards the players get as well as what page the players continue to. In the case of the masked day one, if players win this encounter by ending their turn on the blue exit, they'd read the hidden reward text, then continue to wrong way on page eight. However, if you turn to page eight, you'll find that there is more than one scene listed on that page. When this happens, you're only supposed to read the scene in which you were specifically instructed to. Try your best to avoid spoilers and don't read the sections below. However, in this case, it only details what would have happened if the players lost. After reading the win text for Wrong Way, the players are instructed to continue to setting up camp on page 9. Here, we run into another adventure mechanic. This time, the adventure mechanic calls for a skill check. Depending on whether or not the players succeed this skill check, will change what scene the players continue to next. This method of naturally reading through our adventure book continues until players reach an end scene. These scenes typically detail horrific ends for our heroes, however, this is pretty clear within our narrative when it's a possibility. You typically won't be randomly handed a game over 
We strive to make our narrative make enough sense that when peril is looming to such a degree that it's all or nothing, you'll have a very good idea. On the note of endings, sometimes bad things happen despite all of your efforts. In the event that you are killed in our narrative or you reach some horrific, terrible end, you can always opt to just play these moments again, but I assure you, our playtesters did not. On that note, other than endings, the encounters, the adventure mechanics, and the decisions are really not intended to be attempted again if you don't like the immediate result. If the players lose an encounter, or roll bad on a skill check, or make a bad decision, you should stick with the outcome and continue. You might be thinking, well, yeah, of course, but we really wanted to reiterate that Madara is designed around losing some encounters making some poor decisions, and failing skill checks. We've purposely designed our game to provide a great experience regardless of if you win or lose or roll bad on a skill check. In fact, sometimes the bad decisions can even end up being cooler in the long run. So with that said, if you lose an encounter, get someone killed, or make a seemingly poor decision, know that the game is designed just for you. The last section type we wanted to talk about is story rounds. Story rounds represent the downtime in which our adventurers can catch a break, buy some gear, and rest. Narratively, this is represented through cities, traveling merchants, or even camping with a larger group of people. During a story round, the players will go through the following three steps. Shop and train, explore, and finally, venture forth. The shop and train will take up the bulk of your time during these scenes. During the shop and train step of a story round, players may spend gold to gear up their adventurers by purchasing any of the items the current location has for sale. This is determined very specifically by the listed text on the adventure round. In this example, we're showing what one of the first story rounds of Madara looks like. According to this shop and train step, players can purchase all mundane items, mundane upgrades, and any upgrades the players have materials for. In addition, a random mundane unique item is for sale. So what does this all mean? Well, it means that every single one of our 99 mundane item cards are for sale in this town. In addition, adventurers can purchase all the mundane upgrades. This is actually only just one upgrade called Masterwork. However, if players have the materials for any other upgrades, they could purchase those right now too. And lastly, players would draw a random mundane unique item from the available mundane unique items and put it up for sale. Unique items represent rare items that must usually be found to be acquired. However, stores will occasionally get their hands on them and put one up for sale. Most story rounds will have at least one unique item for sale. If a unique item is ever purchased, it is not replaced. Instead, the store is simply out of stock of super cool rare weapons, meaning that if the story round is ever shopped at in the future and the item has already been purchased, it won't be replaced. In addition, if players opt to not purchase the unique item that is for sale and go on a side quest in an attempt to get more gold or XP, then later return to the same story round, the same unique item will be for sale. This also means that if the players get the chance to gain a random unique item during their travels, this item is never shuffled into the possible loot that can drop since it's for sale down the street at the local shop. In addition to spending gold, players may also spend their adventurer's current XP to purchase new disciplines. In some cases, players might opt to save XP to purchase higher level disciplines on a future story round. Once all the players are ready, they proceed to the explore step of the story round. The explore step gives our adventurers a chance going on side quests and going after bounties. Side quests are just like they sound, a familiar trope in video games and RPGs. The adventurers can get wrapped up in helping the locals, saving those in need, or otherwise getting distracted by other fun things to do. Side quests offer considerable rewards and our game is balanced around players attempting them. A side quest can only be attempted once though, so make sure you try your best. When embarking on a side quest, the players continue to the corresponding page listed and start a new scene, skipping the venture fourth step of the current story round. Most side quests will return players to the story round from whence they came, acquiring new disciplines with XP. If uh, you're a couple gold off from the unique item that you wanted, or one XP away from that cool new discipline, try a side quest. 
Bounties are a special type of side quest. Not all story rounds have bounties available. Those that do have bounties available allow players to attempt a single bounty of a specific difficulty that they own. The only bounty available in Unintentional Malum Act 1 is a two skull bounty called the Blighted Terror. This abominable creature has been terrorizing the locals and there's a considerable reward for slaying it. However, since it has two skulls, it cannot be embarked upon during this particular story round. While players may only attempt a single bounty per story round that allows it, they may attempt the same bounty they have failed on future story rounds. This means the players can attempt a bounty, fail, then attempt it again at a later story round, so long as the later story round specifies that a bounty of the specific difficulty can still be chosen. Oh, and to be clear, a later story round means a story round with a different name. You can't just go on a side quest, return to the same story round, and immediately try the same bounty again. To help players have a good idea of which bounties they can and can't complete, we've categorized our bounties by difficulty rating. This rating is on the front cover and represented by skulls. The Blight of Romstad is a two skull bounty, meaning we recommend the party to have a decent amount of common items before attempting this bounty. When attempting a side quest or a bounty, players get any rewards they earn even if they fail the side quest or bounty. After players have finished all the available side quests, or if they don't want to embark on any more, they continue to the venture fourth step of the story round. The venture fourth step will continue the main story, bringing our hero's journey onwards. While players can skip through all of the side quests, we have balanced the game around doing all of the side quests, so choosing not to do any of them will increase the difficulty of our game tremendously. Okay, cool. So that's the basics of the adventure mode. We'll be revisiting purchasing disciplines and items on a later video, but for now let's move on to the last big part of the adventure mode. The adventure sheet. This sheet is printed in the back of the rulebook and is intended to be written on. If you don't want to mark up your rulebook, uh, we've provided a free printable version of these sheets on our website. The story sheet is used to keep track of gold, uh, your current page number, flags, Achievements, XP, damage, current party members, and if any adventure is injured or currently unselectable. Let's quickly go over what each of these things mean and how they affect your story. At the end of each encounter, the players will tally up how much gold they've earned and add it to their party's gold on the adventure sheet. In Midara, the whole party shares gold and uses this sheet to see how much they have to spend during um, any given point of the campaign. Uh, the current page number is used to keep track of where you are in the adventure book when you stop a session. This makes it easier to pick up where you left off the following week. Flags represent all the permanent choices and outcomes of encounters that will affect the story at a later date. If adventure mechanic ever tells a player to mark a flag on the story sheet, this is what it's referring to. Many adventure mechanics will reference flags some hidden information will even remain hidden if the players have or don't have a certain flag. Whole pages of texts, side quests, and even main quests will drastically change depending on which flags players have. Achievements are very similar to their video game counterpart. Certain counters might have achievements that earn players special rewards for accomplishing special feats. Many of these achievements require certain builds at certain points of the game to make possible. Each party member will have their own individual XP that is spent by the player who controls that character. This is how players keep track of how much XP is available to spend for each adventurer in the party during any given story round. The damage box is only used if players stop a session while an adventurer currently has damage. This can happen if you stop mid-encounter or if you stop between two or more encounters that are meant to be played consecutively. Other than abilities that adventurers can use, in Midara, adventurers only heal their damage when the adventure book tells them to restore. So it's possible that you could be two encounters into a dungeon crawl and still not have been told to restore when you stop your current session. Of course, uh, there is multiple slots for when and if party members join or leave your party. There's also a box for each listed party member called Injured and Unselectable. While unselectable, the party member cannot be chosen for encounters and their gear is inaccessible. While injured, the party member is narratively present, meaning their gear is accessible, but they cannot be selected for an encounter. 
Well, that does it for all the individual unique parts of the adventure mode. These rules cover the fundamental ways in which we handle storytelling in Madara. Unlike other dungeon crawls who rely on drawing random cards, our story is a bit more linear. This method of reading scenes, following adventure mechanics, playing encounters, and marking flags will naturally lead players down a semi-linear path of branching narratives. This allows us to tell a very ornate story while keeping everything in context of each other. On a single playthrough of Unintentional Malum Act 1, players can expect a variety of different content from one group's experience to the next. As the story continues and the flags build up, this will begin to delineate the two groups even further, unlocking different side quests, uh, different companions, different items, and will generally lead to a different ending in our overall uh, narrative. Thanks for watching, and we're going to be covering how to read encounters next. <laughs>